All right. Well, my clock shows noon. So let me get my button go. All right. Let's go ahead and get, get started. All right. Welcome. Thanks for joining the Ombuds Office for Non-Defensive Communication Part 2, The Statement. As most of you know, this is part of our office's Small Bites Big Impact Lunch and Learn series, and we definitely appreciate you being here today. Before we get started, I suspect many of you have been here before, so you've heard this, so just kind of bear with me. But for those of you new to our Lunch and Learns, I want to just quickly go over some logistics for what you can expect today. You are muted and we have turned your video off. And that's really just to reduce distractions, especially since we are recording this session. I will use a poll and I am going to use the chat box to communicate with you throughout. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and take this time to open up that chat box. Again, that is what I will use to pose questions to you so you can answer. And also where you can place questions that you have along the way. I am on my own today, so I will do my best to monitor the chat for questions that are coming in. Um, please know that I will reserve some time at the end. So if I do need to go back and scroll through and see what's been asked, we can do that then. But I'll try to keep my eye on it. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, I'll do my best to respond to that, but it might not be as, um, I might not be as nimble as usual doing this on my own here today. So bear with me. Um, what else do I want to say? If anyone, so we are recording, so keep that in mind. And of course, when you use the chat box, it does display your name, which you probably know by now. So just keep that in the back of your mind if you have any privacy concerns. If you have a situation or have questions that you're not comfortable sharing today or asking today, give us a call. You know, at the end, I will have a slide of all of our contact information. Um, you can schedule a consult or just give us a call to talk through any questions or situations that you want to address. We aim to keep these meetings at 30 minutes, and that's you know, enough time to give you a bite-sized amount of information that you can hopefully start implementing, you know, some new skills you can start using, and also just get you back to your day because I know everyone is busy and has a lot going on. Again, we are recording, and later today or tomorrow, I will send, as always, a follow-up email, you know, thanking you for attending, providing a feedback survey link, providing this recording link, and also providing any links to resources I referenced throughout the presentation. So please rest assured, if I can get links into the chat, I will. If I don't, please know that you don't have to memorize the slides. You don't have to do screenshots. I will provide all of that to you in a follow-up email. And for those who are watching this after the fact and watching the recording, I added all the links to the slides so that you can then reference that information um, and go from there. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so today's presentation again is really sharing some insights from Sharon Strand, El Strand Ellison's book, Taking the War Out of Our Words, The Art of Powerful Non-Defensive Communication. And Ellison in her book asserts that here in the US, communication has become combative. All right, and that our everyday conversations have been turning into what she has dubbed the power struggle. And she defines a power struggle as a situation in which two or more people or groups are competing for control. And that could be you know, in a particular um, group dynamic um, or any particular sphere that those folks might be find themselves in. And as a result of this power struggle, our responses or our reactions become defensive, right? So we typically get into these com combative conversations and get, find ourselves in a power struggle and then have results of defensive reactions. So that's what we're trying to overcome. So that's the good news. Ellison offers three conversation tools to diminish this power struggle. First is the questions, which we talked about back on March 30th. And in our in my reminder email, I did provide a link to that, uh, to that Lunch and Learn presentation video recording. 
as well as the two blog post articles on that topic. I broke it down into um, two parts. So there is a part one and a part two on the blog. And during that presentation, I discussed the value, right, of asking and forming non-defensive questions really to help unlock information, disarm defensiveness, and interrupt this power struggle that we're talking about. So today we're shifting our focus to the second installment, if you will, uh, the statement. And this is to discuss how stating our reactions to what another person is saying in a neutral, sincere, honest way helps eliminate defensiveness. It can help achieve clarity and it fosters progress. It's very forward thinking, forward moving. So the idea here is that speaking truthfully and openly without fear and without hiding can not only strengthen our communication, but it can help elicit more positive responses. So I'm gonna go ahead and put up a poll here. Just wanna get a sense before we go any further of how many of you um, did have a chance, if I can get my toolbar to populate here. Okay, here we go. Uh, how many of you did have a chance to either uh, attend that March 30th Lunch and Learn, watch the video or read the um, related blog post. So go ahead and let me know. There's no judgment here. Um, we, you can certainly stay and if you haven't, that's not the point. I just wanna kind of get a sense of, of the audience here a minute. Okay, fair. Thank you for being honest. I appreciate that. Okay, so it looks like about half of you, more than half of you, okay, more than half of you didn't or are not sure. So that's okay, no problem. Hang in there. We'll get through today's um, workshop presentation and feel free. I'll include those links again in the follow-up email. Feel free to go back. I am going to do a little refresher here, but it's not really going to dive into any of the nuts and bolts. So you might want to go back and, and, and watch that or read those posts. They're short. Um, the presentation is 30 minutes and the blog posts are like a page or two. So not too intense. Okay, but thank you for doing that. That's helpful. All right, I'll share the results just so you can all see it. And then we will go ahead and move forward. <laughs> All right. So let's do um, let's do that. Let's do a little uh, refresher here. So quick refresher on March 30th, as I mentioned, I did present the part one, right, which was really addressing the reality that most of us simply do not ask enough questions, and that that's for many reasons, right? Many of us. We're brought up to believe that you know probing or asking questions is rude or invasive or disrespectful, and so we kind of got out of that natural human tendency um, to be curious and inquisitive. And so the point of this is to kind of retrain our brains to do that and to do it in a way that does not feel uh, invasive or accusatory or judgmental. To do non-defensive questions. So that's really what the gist of it was, and the value of asking non-defensive questions, as you can see here on this slide was to do four things, to help clarify assumptions that you might be making, right? Assumptions are when we assume we know, but maybe we don't have all the information to really stop and, and reevaluate that. It allows us to get more information and it allows us to separate uh, the people from the issue, right? Rather than responding to what's being said, really try to understand what's happening and what's going on for that other person um, and to increase accountability. And so again, not gonna cover all that again today, but that's what you can look forward to if you go back and revisit those materials. All right. We also learned that non-defensive questions have four elements, okay? They are curious, they're open, they're neutral in tone, much like the statement we're gonna be talking about today, and they're inviting, right? It's really an attempt to invite and encourage someone to participate and to be open to hearing what might not be comfortable, right? What might we might not like to hear, but being open to that. So that was really the crux of that presentation. And here, um, for those of you watching the recording, here are the links. Again, for those of you here today, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna take time to cut and paste into the chat right this moment, but I will include all of this in the follow-up email. Please rest assured. All right, and you can always, these, these resources are there, right? So you can always refer back to them as needed. So today we're talking about statements and this is all about speaking truthfully and openly, right? Without fear, without hiding. And as I mentioned earlier, this can help us strengthen our communication and also elicit more positive responses. 
Conversely, when we don't do this and we're guarded or we're hiding information, it does impede our ability to you know, resolve issues and to be creative, right? The more information we can gather and the more open conversations we have, the more room for creativity and problem solving. So the goal is to be vulnerable and direct, right? Um, this increases our effectiveness. Now, sounds great, right? And yet, as I've said probably many times before to other skill builders I've presented, it's easier said than done. And it does take practice because we're really, you know, creating new neural pathways. We're retraining our brain to think differently and approach things differently. And that's no easy task. So it does take time and it does take practice. And actually I have a blog post, a little sneak peek, a blog post coming out this Wednesday about that transfer of knowledge. You know, how do we, we come to these workshops? We come to these trainings. We hear someone talk about these different skills and ways of doing things. How do we then implement those in our workplace? And so that blog post is going to give some tips and tools on how to do that. So, um, please look for that. Um, but why is this so difficult, right? Um, and that it is difficult because our natural tendency um, when we're making a statement is to be powerful, right? We want um, our statements to um, be compelling, okay? So you've heard these statements that we're going to be talking about, and you've probably made some of them yourselves. Um, they're statements where you're removing any question, right? Any doubt. Uh, there's no concession. There's no room for maybe other possibilities or other ideas or other perspectives. It's, it's very absolute. Um, in other words, you're avoiding vulnerability. And again, as I already mentioned, when we do that, we tend to keep ourselves in conflict rather than resolve it. Okay. So let's, we're going to use a scenario to kind of play um, through some examples for the rest of today's session. Uh, if you did read the blog in particular, this will sound very familiar because I literally took it right from the blog. So um, let's go ahead. I'll go ahead and read this out loud and, we'll, and then we'll move forward. Okay, here's a scenario. Consider Pat and Chris. Pat is Chris's supervisor. They've worked together for a little over a year. Pat asked Chris to complete a report by the end of the week. Funding for a large department project relied on the report. However, as things happen, a payroll system error came up during the week, which Chris spent the week fixing. Chris felt badly that the report wasn't completed as requested and had a hard time looking Pat in the eye when confronted about it. In hindsight, Chris does wonder if there was a better way of handling his dilemma. So let's think about this. Let's think about some possible conversations that might, and of course there's many other possibilities, but we're gonna focus on three or four conversations of how this might go. So conversation number one, Pat, the supervisor says, the assignment was due today. Why haven't you completed it? Chris, the employee responds with, I didn't have time. I've been working on the payroll system problem that needed to be fixed right away. Pat, getting visibly angry, right? Red in the face, pounding on the desk. You never meet your deadlines. You don't know how to multitask. You need to get your act together or you are not going to make it here. All right, so tell me, if you haven't opened your chat, go ahead and open your chat. What do you think? How would you, give me one word you would use to describe this conversation. And do you think it's helpful? Eek. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Eek. Right. That's a good response. Too late. Yeah, it's very accusatory. Yes. Aggressive. Absolutes. Yes. These are all spot on. Disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Unproductive. I would agree, Ingrid. Probably not going to you know, I don't think Pat is really looking at the big picture here. What does you really want, right? Which is one of my favorite questions. What do you really want here, right? Are you going to achieve that? Is that going to be the desired outcome? All right. So thank you for doing that. Let's keep going. I don't want to spend too much time um, uh, so we make sure we get through everything. But yes, you all hit the nail on the head. And, and aggressive, um, I don't let me look and see who said aggressive. Rebecca, yes, that was the word I used. It's a very aggressive approach, right? And probably isn't going to be helpful in 
in hopefully what Pat's you know desire is is to understand what happened and to maybe possibly find ways of avoiding this problem going forward. So we'll get to that. I mean, I'm getting my head of myself. All right, so let's try another conversation. Conversation number two. Again, same thing, Pat. Assignment was due today. Why haven't you completed it? Chris, I didn't have time. I've been working on the payroll system problem that had to be fixed right away. So this time, Pat responds with his statement is, ha, everyone has an excuse. Some people just don't know how to complete work on time. What do you think? Back to the chat. What do you think? Any better? How would you describe this? Yes, Kate. Oh my gosh. I promise I did not pay Kate in advance for this answer, but Kate says passive aggressive. That's exactly what I had put down. Right. It's very passive aggressive, ew, condescending. Yes. You got so you're all ahead of the curve here. You know exactly what, where we're headed with this. Yes. And productive. Yep. All, all true statements. So yeah, so this probably also is not going to help <laughs> Pat and Chris move forward in their relationship, resolve this issue, or you know, improve things going forward. So the point here is neither conversation one or two really provide the corrective feedback in an appropriate way, right? An appropriate way would be letting Chris know you know, this, you know, the consequence, there are consequences to not getting this report done and, you know, how, how Pat might prefer he deal with it um, or other similar issues going forward. So let's, let's give Pat another chance here. Okay. Again, assignments due. Why isn't it complete? Chris, I didn't have time. I've been working on the payroll system that had to be fixed right away. So this time, Pat, with a serious face, um, says, Okay, I understand the payroll problem had to be fixed and I was counting on you to finish the report I asked you to complete by today. Not having the report ready means we will not secure funding for project XYZ. We can't let this happen again. Next time you find that you won't be able to meet a critical deadline because of other high priorities, right? Because it's life, these things happen. I know that's not in there, I'm adding, I'm ad-libbing a little here. Um, let me know right away. Um, so that we can discuss it, work out the priorities, maybe even get someone else to help so we can get both projects done. What do you think? Better? You can use the chat. Tell me what you think. Transparent, much better, right? And I'm not saying any of these are perfect. Right. They could all probably be the massage, but just to kind of get some flavor here. Yes. Action oriented. Right. It's addressing the issue, stating the consequence and really encouraging Chris to be more transparent so that they can work together to resolve this. You know, and if I'm Pat, I also probably want to try to find out, like, you know, kind of the, the why behind and we'll get to this. Why didn't Chris come to me? Right. What? Like, am I not approachable? You know, is, is there some fears or something other barrier getting in the way here? So that's something he'll probably want to address. Mm hmm. Yeah. Helping me. Yeah. Michelle. Right. Maybe seek other resources. More collaborative. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. All great answers. Cooperative understanding. Yeah. I mean, right. Understand it. life happens. There's, there's no it's no secret. Right. That things are going to pop up unexpected and we're going to have these dilemmas, competing interests, competing priorities. The question is, are we dealing with it in a productive and collaborative way? So all great answers. Oh, let's see one more new one. Um, Sure. Could Pat own some responsibility? Sure. We don't have a lot of that. We don't, there's probably a lot more going on in these kinds of situations. And if Pat, if there's something there, like, you know, could he have followed up? Did he need to check in? Um, you know, we don't know has Chris, how long has Chris been working there? I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, like what is the relationship? What are the expectations and communication when you're working on projects? You know, all of those things could also have contributed if there was, a, if it's any, if Pat also dropped the ball in some way, for sure. Um, yes. And Aaron's also brings up the point of there seem to be some assumptions of how communication, right? So that might be another top of the conversation, Aaron. You know, especially if I were working with a visitor and a consult to explore, uh, you know, what are the communication expectations? Do they need to be revisited? You know, is this a situation where we need to reevaluate our team norms or our communication norms because um, there's not enough, right? Maybe there's not enough communication or it's not effective communication. What's getting in the way there? So great observations. Thank you all. All right. So moving forward. 
So as we think about this, there are really, you know, we think about non-defensive statements. There's really four different kinds, four formats, if you will, for making non-defensive statements. And I want you to keep in mind as we go into the next section here, um, you know, how and when you might use them. A lot of it's going to depend on your personality, your communication style, the relationship, the issue, um, how important, right, the, how, how high stakes, low stakes any situation is. Because my point being, this is not linear. Um, you may use all four, you may only use one. So it's really an art, not a science here, right? You may um, use them in different combinations. Okay, so I just wanna take a quick look at the four of them here, and then we'll take a closer look at each one. And I'm noticing the time always goes by so quickly. So I'll try to speed things up a little bit. But the first one is really reporting back, paraphrasing what you're hearing the other person say what they are consciously overtly saying. The other one is describing your experience. How are you experiencing what they're saying? What's coming up for you? The third one is making observation about anything you don't see, or I'm sorry, anything that you see that is not being said, right? That's the body language, the facial expressions, any other um, you know, less obvious um, observations that you're making that are contributing to the narrative, to how you're interpreting what's happened or what's being said. And then finally, it's sharing more of your own personal reaction. What's coming up for you? How is this impacting and affecting you? Your feelings, your thoughts, um, what you would like, what actions or behaviors would you like? Those kinds, of, those kinds of things. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at each one. And we'll keep using our Pat and Chris scenario. So in the first one, you're reporting back. Right, you're simply paraphrasing what you hear someone saying to convey that you hear them, that you understand them, and or making sure that you understand them. Right, give them an opportunity to clarify if you don't. So here, Chris tells Pat, "I didn't have time. I've been working on the payroll system problem that had to be fixed right away." You know, Pat could simply, you know, one 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 of the four things he might do is, you know, reiterate that. Okay, so what I hear you saying, you just spent the week working on the payroll system problem, just to make sure he understands Chris's perspective um, properly. You know, the key here is to make sure it sounds sincere because that is the, the pitfall. You just gotta check your tone. And, um, you know, if you do have an assumption, state it and let them confirm or deny that your, that your assumption is correct. You know, that might then lead to another conversation and some follow-up questions to make sure there's clear understanding of what's of what Chris is trying to say here. The second one is making observations about anything you see in the person's overt or covert message that contradicts what you hear them say. So with this kind of a statement, you're making more detailed observations of what you hear and see rather than just a general statement like, wow, that you really seems to be really frustrated by that, or it seems like that was really a hard choice for you to make, right? You're really getting into um, what you're observing in that communication. So for instance, in this scenario, Pat could say something like, okay, so it sounds like you're saying that you felt, you know, fixing or that you determined, right? That fixing the payroll system needed to take precedence over completing the report. And I noticed that you looked away when you said that, because there might be more to the story here, there might be more going on for Chris than what he's actually just saying. So Pat is basically bringing attention to other observations he's making that may help flesh out and add some information and some motive and other things beneath the surface that are going on here. And the key here is using and instead of but. And I'm sure you've heard that in many other communication trainings you've attended or read about, um, but of course negates everything you've just said. So you don't wanna negate that you understand what he's telling you. You're just supplementing. You know, it's, I, under, I hear what you're telling me. And I'm also wondering what else might be going on here because of what I'm noticing, what I'm observing. All right, I know I'm moving quickly, so hang in there folks. Okay, the third one is describing your experience. And this is adding any additional meaning that we might be attaching to the message about that, what could be, or what is a perceived underlying cause or motive. So here, Pat, you know, could say, you, you knew, you know, we needed to complete the report to get the funding for the project X, Y, Z. And I believe you truly were conflicted about these competing priorities. 
And I also wonder if now you're second guessing how you handle the situation. So he's inferring motive behind that hesitation that he observed, the looking away. You know, in the scenario I talked about, Chris had a hard time looking Pat in the eye. So we can, you know, picture him, you know, kind of looking away to saying it. That's telling something. That's telling more to the story. It's also probably sharing some motive. So Pat, you know, it, it makes sense for Pat to want to follow up on that to see what else is going on for Chris. Um, now, this is difficult, right? This is not something that most of us have learned to do effectively. Um, so again, these three formulas can be used alone or interchangeably or, or in conjunction with each other to really allow us to interpret the situation, examine our own assumptions, and maybe provide some insights. You know, maybe Pat can, you know, share some insights with Chris that Chris doesn't even really know what's going on for him. And that can then have a more inclusive conversation. Um, the final one we're going to talk about before we um, start wrapping up here is how we then can express our, so this is describing, you know, the experience, but how do we express what's coming up for us? Because likely Pat's having his own reactions during the course of this conversation. So how might he effectively express those in a meaningful, constructive way? Okay, so this is where you're describing what's coming up for you, you know, your values, your emotions. Um, your thoughts, um, any behaviors or actions, right, related to the issue. So in this final format, you are, it's almost like priming, you know, if you've taken crucial conversations and you're familiar with, with priming, whereas the first one's more the mirroring, or I'm sorry, the second one's more the mirroring. You're saying this, but I'm also wondering this based on, you know, some body language. This one's more the priming because you're kind of guessing a little bit at what that cause or motivation might be that underlines what they're saying, what you're hearing, especially if it's contradictory, right? If what you, if what they're saying contradicts um, what you suspect, right? Or um, because of body language or facial expressions or tone, there seems to be something, a different meaning going on here. So here you're describing any additional meaning you might be that might be attached to the message, such as that underlying cause or motive. So let's look at the situation. Um, Pat might say something like, I understand it is difficult when there are competing priorities, and yet I wish you had come and talked with me so that we could have found a solution to fix the payroll error and complete the report, meeting everyone's needs and interests. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. I'm grateful that the, that the payroll error is, is fixed. Um, and I'm disappointed, right? The report was not completed. Um, I'm also sad and confused about why you didn't come to me to discuss the conflict, right? The dilemma that you were presented with. Um, I would like to understand what prevented you from coming to me to discuss this and also to discuss how we can get past that right, so that we can avoid these situations in the future. So those are the four different formats that you can use in delivering a non-defensive statement. And, you know, and you'll know, you know, what makes sense to you, um, what works for you, and, and you can, you know, play around with them a little bit. The under the, the overarching message here, and I realize we're at 28, so if you have to hop off right at 1230, I totally get it. Um, we're almost done here. The non-defensive statements, you know, the message here is they're important because they reflect our conscious awareness of the implications and effect of someone else's behavior, whether it's negative or positive, right? It allows us to give and receive information about how others are affecting our lives and how we're affecting their lives. So when we don't do this, you know, our the health of our relationships potentially deteriorates. When we use non-defensive statements, we're disrupting this power structure, stru uh, struggle that Ellison is, keeps referring to, and we keep the information flowing. Um, you know, we can have more inclusive, inviting conversations and really explore what's really going on here so that we can get more creative and open up the possibilities for finding resolutions that will, will serve everyone involved. Um, and this helps sustain right, healthy relationships in communities, which I think is everyone who's here, the goal, right, um, in, at work and in your personal lives. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm just going to wrap up again. And then um, if people want to stay on, I'll stop the recording and we can do some Q&A. 
Um, I will again, you know, here's the link to the book. Here's the link to the blog post for this particular um, topic. And again, I will send those out to you in an email. And here's how you can reach us, right? You can, if you want to schedule a consult, if you want to learn more about our services, subscribe to our blog, please. Yes. Um, follow us on Twitter if you use Twitter. And all of our Lunch and Learn recordings are on YouTube. So you can always go there to see what we've done and, and to revisit things, refresh. Um, you can get, you can access them through our website as well. So go ahead. I'm going to, let me see if I can get, I'm going to stop the recording. Um,